Hi, my name is Cortez Randolph, and this is my broken and not dead story. I'm broken, I'm dead. As I can recall, at the age of 12, I grew up in a, um, a less restricted home for as I didn't have my, you know, father around. Didn't know who my father was at the time. Um, didn't recognize that my mother was, you know, using drugs, but abusing them at the time. And as I went on and started growing up, I seen that she had an addiction, but she couldn't support being my, uh, my oldest brother. And we were staying in a two bedroom apartment. And as she couldn't, you know, complete her assignment um, and responsibilities of taking care of us, we went out on our own and tried to, you know, get in and supply our every need. And doing the things that I was doing, um, knowing that it wasn't, you know, right for the community or uh, to, to myself. I started getting caught. Um, I got locked up at the age of 13 um, in Tennessee Valley Juvenile Detention Center. I, I started to become a repeatedly offender where I was, uh, I was in and out of that place like every two weeks. At the age of 14, I committed a crime that, um, first degree robbery, that they charged me as an adult. And I was locked in the county jail at the age of 15 and had a $50,000 bond. So when I, when I went through that, went through the process of that, and ended up getting out on um, house arrest. So being on house arrest, not having no, no confined place to go, I graduated from still and tried to sell drugs to complete my, you know, the habits that I picked up smoking marijuana. And that only got worse. I went to prison at the age of 17 and it was, it was, it was a roller coaster. You know, seeing it, going to prison, staying in three years, seeing that type of environment, it wasn't, it didn't dawn on me because I stayed three years and I was so used to being confined and around some of the same people that I was around coming up as a juvenile, the same people that was, I was familiar with in prison. So we all of us grew with age and all of us end up in prison at the same age. So me seeing them, it's just like a brother, a, a big brother to me. I didn't take it too deep. So I got out when I was the age of 20 and end up thinking I'm a, with my chest out thing, okay, prison was the stuff, this, you know, prison was the place to be. And, you know, got the big head that can't nobody tell me nothing. I'm grown now, I got my little car and, you know, picked up a little drug, you know, selling drugs and feel like I'm, I'm above everybody. But no, tables and turn. I ended up going back to prison. This time I stayed for five years. I told myself, I said, hey, the time is over. No more games, you know, I'm tired. I'm, 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 I'm ready to give it up. So I, I, do, I did five years, I get out, and I had an um, oldest son that I left at the age of five, and he was now 10 when I got out. So I had him looking up to me, and I had to change my life because of him. And um, end up meeting this older woman. Again, she was like 37, I was like, like 28. And she introduced me back to God. She took me to church, took like into what the preacher was saying, which I knew the word was for me. He told me, you know, that I got one foot in and one foot out. So and he told me to take, take that foot that I had out and put it back in. And he's gonna, you know, change my life. So I decided to do that. I left the streets alone. I left the drugs alone. I, I came up out of it. And I told God, I said, hey, I'm all in. And this was 2013. So 2014 is where my life took a real spin. It made the 31st, 2014, um, where I went and got my oldest son. And he was nine years old at the time. And um, I went and got him, and we was going to get our hair cut. That's normal routine. So we inside the you know barber shop, sitting around. So my phone rung, and I went outside, and you know I I'm talking on the phone to my girlfriend, and we trying to you know make ends meet. And so uh, in the midst of that, it was a guy that was in the barber shop that he he's been in tour with my brother, you know, for several weeks now. So me being a changed man and always trying to be the peacemaker. I um, pulled him to the side and said, hey man, I ain't got nothing to do with you, what you and my brother got going on, but just, you know, keep my mother out of it. And so he went to, you know, got furious and got angry and was just like, hey man, bump you, bump what you talking about and this and that, this and that. So I'm like, cool. You know, I said a little words back and didn't know he was gonna, didn't push him enough to knowing that he was going to get a gun. So I just thought he was gonna leave and just, you know, not, not return. So I'm still out there on the phone, you know, chit chatting and, he pulled back up. So when he pulled back up, you know, I'm not a fool to, you know, disturbance or a beef like that. I know about it because I've been there. And he pulled back up and he held his hand out 
He was like, what you want to do now? And when I tried to go in the door of the barbershop, the door was the door was like somebody was holding the door. So I let up off the door for at least about one or two seconds. It was my son coming out. So when he come out, I'm trying to go, you know, push him back in. I don't want to try to make a loud scene or try to run. So I try to ease back in. And when I turn and try to go back in, the guy shot one time out the truck and hit me in my hit me in my chest. And I immediately hit the ground in front of my son. Leaving me devastated. I, mean, I was at a point like, man, you know, what What I do now, I just pray and hope he don't come stand over me, you know, because I can't move. You know, I'm trying, trying to move. So my son went in and got the, the, the barber. He came back out. And um, when he come out, he looked at me, he said, man, you're not bleeding nowhere. My son is screaming out his lungs. He said, you're not bleeding nowhere. I said, man, I've been shot. You know, I said, I can't even move. I can't feel nothing, you know. So when the Amalams get there, you know, everybody, ain't nobody panicking, everything, I'm still, you know, talking. And he said, man, the level of injury, he said, somebody's with you. He said, because the level of your injury, he said, man, you're only supposed to be talking, you're supposed to be breathing. He said, you bleeding on the inside. He said, it's what a wound, man. He said, it's like three inches from your heart. When they got me off the ambulance, I get ready to roll in and it was something like a movie. And last thing I told God, I said, God, please don't let me die. And his words, it's the first time he ever spoke to me. He said, I got you. And I went under. And you know, when I woke up, I woke up furious because I'm so drugged up, didn't know where I was at. I pulled the, the I pulled my, my breathing thing out my out my throat. So that that set off a alarm. And the doctor come in, he cleared the room. He said, I got I'm gonna talk to you when I come back. So they put me in the room, they set me up. He came in, he said, You ready for the news? I said, Yes, sir. He said, You almost got away from us. He said, We had gave, we gave you up. They had went and told my family that it, it ain't looking good. My family told me that uh, they was falling out in the, in the waiting room. It was just a disaster. He said, well, the good news, you're alive. He said, the bad news is you ain't gonna be able to walk again. So I'm like, man, what, what I supposed to do now? And God just said, just, just stay calm, just stay calm. And that's what I did. I had to shut down my visitation for like two weeks in the hospital. You know, I played my spiritual music and got in tune with God and started reading more because I'm, I'm transitioning to a whole nother life. God, you know, put me by myself and, you know, told me that, that he's going to use my story and my life to inspire other people. So uh, I was laying in bed one day and by me being new to, you know, uh, just a ministry, church and things like that, I laid around and I was asking questions and he was like, I need you to name um, a ministry. So I looked up in the dictionary the what ministry mean. And man, when I put a name on it, and it was walk with me, and it 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 dawned on me. I said, walk with me. What do that mean? And I was like, to walk with me is to know that I have the vision, I have the purpose to do it, and I have a testimony. But I need those that that's broken and that's you know, that's going through things in life to walk with me. And so we can, you know, make the world better. So I'm just hoping that my story and my life testimony will um, change the world. And not only change the world, but will bring people to uh, realize that no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter what, what comes up against you, don't let it knock you down and just to keep moving. And that's what I learned, you know, as I'm still learning as I still go through things, every, uh, everything is new to me. And it's, and it's good because I'm learning how to adapt to it. And I come across people and I talk to people and you never know who life you can change. And I done changed, you know, a lot of people's, you know, circumstances, life, just by, you know, giving them word of advice. And I just thank God for that. And I'm learning, I'm still learning and my testimony is still rising. So that's my broken and not dead story.